Okay, thanks to Only South Africans for joining us on YouTube and of course to our regular YouTube viewers who've joined me now, hopefully for some more detail and discussion of what KTM calls its long distance beast. Before I get started though, if you make a comment and get a message in the comments saying that you've won something from us, ignore it. It's a scam. We'll never contact you in that way and we're too stingy to give you a prize anyway. Whatever you do, don't obviously part with any of your personal details. We have dealt, we hope, with the problem, so hopefully it's sorted out completely. But with these slimy cyber scum, you never know. Just be aware. Right, back to the bike. There's so much I want to cover, and knowing what I'm like, despite my best intentions to cover the stuff in some kind of logical order, I'm bound to disappear up a few tangents along the way, so apologies in advance for that. This will hopefully cover all the details you're interested in if you're an owner or seriously thinking about buying this bike. So I won't be offended in any way at all if uh, less invested viewers switch off or fall asleep in this follow-up long form part of the test. This is definitely for the grown-ups with a longer than average attention span. Someone who can read a wordy newspaper article and someone who doesn't get into a panic when confronted by a paragraph that's longer than a hundred words, something that seems to happen to a disappointingly large percentage of people these days. Damn, <laughs> I haven't even started and already I'm moaning. Back to the review. I took a bit more of a detour to scout some roads when I took the bike back to KTM and so I was in the seat for a four hour stretch and covered about 300 kilometers. No motorways but lots of obeying the speed limit which is a South African journalist, does not come naturally. That sort of distance, even in the mountains, wouldn't take me much more than a couple of hours back home. Anyway, my view of the GT was being refined the more I rode it. I'm happy to have an opinion about a bike if I need to after just a couple of hundred kilometers. It's, it's the sort of thing you have to do all the time on a bike's international launch where 200 Ks or not much more is often all you have on the bike. However, ideally, you have a lot longer because the extra time does inevitably reveal much more. And so it was with this GT. I have to admit that I have changed my opinion about this model compared to the last time that I rode it properly. And, and part of that comes down to me realizing its intended purpose isn't quite what I thought it was. It's that whole GT designation that threw me a bit. As a Grand Tourer, I assumed that like cars with the same label, it's meant to be a relaxed, high-speed cruising and luxuriously comfortable, yet still adequately sporty bike. Think of other GTs like BMW six-cylinder bikes and you get the idea, although that particular bike is skewed way towards the other end of the spectrum, obviously. Anyway, after my last 300 kilometers with the bike and with an extra day to let the past week really sink in, this is not really a GT bike at least not in that traditional sense. And contrary to what I said in the test, it's not really a direct competitor to BMW's XR or Ducati's Multi, but is probably more an expensive alternative to the likes of Kawasaki's Ninja SX or Suzuki's new GSX-S 1000 GT. The riding position is relaxed superbike. And you can adjust the handlebar position slightly, which I never actually got around to. After that four hours of saddle time yesterday, I have to admit, once I had it in my head that this is a relaxed superbike riding position and accepted that there was going to be at least a little wrist and shoulder pain, I realized I could live with it. And the seat, I've changed my mind again there. And although obviously I had a numb bum when I got to Matikhoven, I really can't complain too much. I'd expected to be in genuine pain and I wasn't. I'd save you money and keep the standard seat. It's, it's pretty much well up to the job. Yesterday's ride was in 32 degree heat and um, it actually became unbearable at slower speeds because the heat pumping off that engine boiled my, my left man egg and then poached it and then for good measure fried it. If you live in a hot country, be aware that you will end up sticking your left knee in the breeze and sitting side saddle and even standing up whenever the speed drops much below 100 k's. 
The fuel tank I haven't mentioned, by the way, is massive, which is great for it being a long distance beast. But if you're really gentle, you might even see 400 kilometers from its 23 liters. But ride it like a superbike and don't be surprised when it's warning of low fuel at half that distance. And by the way, I know the 175 horsepower headline figure is impressive, but I have to say it's pretty much irrelevant because you ride this bike on its tour. If you want the 175 horsepower, then obviously you need to get the engine spinning up towards the red line, but you never do because it's more than quick enough for any decently challenging road when you short shift through the gears. Talking with the guys at the factory, they shared some interesting stats about the riding research they'd done with their own test riders. And I'm not quoting directly here because my memory isn't exactly as it was. So I may not be on the money with the exact details, but it seems that the GTs in the test fleet were spending around about 80% of their time at three and a half thousand RPM or under. These are some scarily fast guys, remember, and although it's an average of all types of riding, it shows you how important, how useful is that bottom end well of instant grunt from this 1.3 litre V-twin. Right, staying with the good stuff, the quick shifter when it works well, which is when you're riding pretty hard, it works really well. Some of the upshifts are barely noticeable, but at normal, legal, slower speeds, it can be pretty rough, especially on the downshifts. Even upshifts in the lower speeds, up to about 70, 80 k's an hour can be horrible. Almost like the ignition is being cut for too long. You just have to take over and do it yourself and, and then it's fine, if you know how to change gear smoothly. I wonder if it's something to do with big twins because I've encountered the same sort of thing with BM's large capacity boxer engines and even their 900cc parallel twins as well, to be fair. Oh, and while I remember, the biker standard comes with the quick shifter able to go up through the gears. If you want the auto blipping down change, then you need to pay for the optional quick shifter plus, which, well, is it just me or in an age where even my own budget conscious MT-09 has a both ways quick shifter as standard? I don't know, it just, it feels like an unnecessarily cheap shot, don't you think? Moving on, if you want navigation with your long distances, then this latest GT now has turn-by-turn -turn directions on the TFT screen in conjunction with the KTM riding app. I didn't test it, I always just listen to my navigation via headphones, but I'm sure it'll be a welcome addition for many prospective buyers. The screen itself has also had a welcome upgrade to the same one that graces the Super Adventure, and very nice it is too, large, clear on the whole, though sometimes I do think it's stacked with too much info, some of which ends up being a bit small. Yes, I do need reading glasses, and the first person who offers me a uh, reading visor will be handsomely rewarded. I had no electrical unreliability with this bike, although I did have to wave the keyless fob in the general direction of the front end at one time to make it realize I wanted to get going. And also at one point I got a message come up on the dash saying general suspension failure or something. Although everything felt fine and once I stopped and started again, the message disappeared and everything ran perfectly for the rest of the week. Also, while I'm on the subject, I'm a massive fan of keyless systems. Just makes life so easy. Though I know some of you similarly crusty old farts to me bemoan the loss of a traditional key. Adapt, I say, you will learn to love it, I'm sure. The buttons, they're upgraded to the new stuff that debuted on the Super Duke R for its last update, and they're backlit, which is very helpful. They're clear, logically presented, though there is one seriously irritating flaw that I simply have to have a whinge about. The indicator switch is well, it's beyond annoying. There's no click or feedback when you've pressed it right or left, or especially when you cancel the indicators. I know it's only the indicator switch, and many of you will probably be saying that I'm making a mountain out of a molehill, but if you do use your indicators a lot, like I do, it's properly frustrating because the only way to be sure you've got the desired result from your prod is to look at the dash and it isn't always desirable to be taking your eyes off the road, even for a second. In KTM's defense, they apparently are well aware of the problem and are 
fix will be coming in the next button update, whenever that is. In the meantime, this GT now has self-cancelling indicators that will turn themselves off after about 15 seconds, I think it is. Better than nothing, I suppose, but some button feedback would definitely be better. Sometimes I do wonder how this sort of thing gets through all the testing. Do the test riders not use their indicators? Does the designer of an otherwise excellent rider technology interface not realize that the indicator button is the one control that you will interact with more than any other? Okay, wind over. And to balance that bit of criticism, I must admit that all the menus and the way of navigating through them is intuitive for even an idiot like me to manage without referring to the manual, so it is genuinely very good. I particularly like the favourites feature that allows you to display permanently on the screen four of the readouts you most use or enjoy. For me that was the clock, front and rear tyre pressures and the outside air temperature. The customizable switch for quick access to two functions of your choice is also an excellent idea. Set it up to get to your heated grips, for instance, now standard by the way, or perhaps to adjust your suspension damping settings. Once again, the choice of what you can put there is wide and useful. I also love the fact that you can mix and match all the systems. So for instance, you might have the ride mode set to sport with a single rider and luggage preload, which I often did without the luggage because I just like the rear jacked up and a bit firmer than normal. And you can separately tune in the throttle response or the suspension damping. I often had the softer street or comfort suspension, even in sport mode, if I wanted to deal with a properly bumpy back road. The same goes, if you've ticked all the options, for things like traction control that can be adjusted independently of the ride mode. And so being able to adjust for having my wife on the back and getting on and off with all her camera gear with just a couple of button pushes is fantastic. I found myself playing with the suspension settings much more than I would on a traditionally suspended bike because it's so easy. I mean, let's face it, most of us are too lazy, well, I'm too lazy, let me just say that, to get a spanner or screwdriver out just to adjust the suspension. I set it once and then leave it. We all do, don't we? In terms of other electronics, like the hill hold control, useful, and I enjoy it, but not strictly necessary. Cornering lights, where the intensity increases the further you lean to help light up the inside of a turn. Again, a nice to have, but not strictly necessary, unless of course you do a lot of night riding on completely unlit roads, and I don't. Cruise control, as always, very useful, but there's no radar assisted cruise control, which there is on the Super Adventure S. People, including me, tend to think of it as a gimmick until, like me, They've used it and found it extremely useful for those long motorway journeys where you're transitioning to somewhere with good roads. If you've ever appreciated standard cruise control on a long journey, then you will appreciate this update to the system. But it's not here. I presume making space for the square forward-facing black sensor box requires a full-face redesign, so that's one of the reasons I think we'll see a more comprehensive update for the GT next year. That and the fact that the GT is still using a generation older frame and adaptive suspension system. What else? The mirrors are pretty good, largely free of vibration, so generally nice and clear. The panniers are super easy to use and good quality, though just a little bit too small for my liking. Oh, and... Um, the panniers on my bike, and this is entirely my own fault because I refuse to wait for KTM to source the appropriate parts. My panniers were black, but if you order them, they have a color coordinated panel on them that makes them blend in with your bike's graphics more stylishly. Sorry, KTM. Sorry, viewer. Check out the website for images of the proper matching setup. Um, what else? as I just have a look at my uh, rather disorganised notes. Neutral can be occasionally a, a little bit fiddly to find, but you do always get there on the third or fourth go. The looks of the GT? In the past, I would have said it was plain old ugly. 
but the more I live with it, the more I grew to appreciate them. Yeah, it's by no means pretty, but it is distinctive and that's a plus in a crowded marketplace where the most egregious sin of all is to make something too conformist or too bland. That's not something you can say about this bike. I took the panniers off as well and then you get more clearly that superbike vibe. Surprisingly lithe and athletic I think was my first impression of it without its luggage. Overall my respect and fondness for the GT really increased during this test. It feels, and I don't mean this in a sexist way, but it feels like a sort of manly, macho sport touring weapon. It might be relatively agile, as I said in the test, but it's noticeably less so than the Super Adventure, by the way. And, uh, more of that in next week's test. But it still feels like you have to commit be decisive and purposeful with the way you ride it to, to get the best from the GT. And the engine, of course, is it's just a thing of wonder. And I'm already a sucker for a big twin. Yeah, I could really see me being in the market for this bike if I had the cash to go for a Sport Tourer, which after naked sport bikes is my favorite type of motorcycle. I said in the past I'd have BMW's XR over this and I don't think I can say the same anymore. I'd take the GT now, even if it is less accommodating over long distances. The advantage in terms of sporty V-twin goodness when you get to the mountains is it's just too big to ignore. Ducati's multi V4 complicates matters further, but it's dual purpose. And I think totally kitted out is also more expensive. So I'm going to use that as an excuse to not even factor it into my reckoning now. So, mind changed ultimately. The GT is a hugely impressive bike. I can understand why it's on anyone's shortlist for a do-it-all machine to have in your garage. And uh, I think that's it from me. I'm sure the stuff I've forgotten, but I've run out of steam now and you're all probably asleep anyway. Hello? <laughs> if you're still awake, then thanks for watching and I hope this extra discussion video helps you make a choice about your next sport touring bike and if you've got one of these then feel free to dive into the comments and tell me if you agree or disagree with what I've been saying and all the other important stuff that I've obviously forgotten about. Thanks for your time, see you in the next one, cheers for now.